-hmm. Hello, thank you for joining us for our presentation on using machine learning to expand access to World War II incarcerated data. This work is part of a project uh, funded by the National Park Service Japanese American Confinement Sites Grant Program, and it's being run through the Bancroft Library at UC Berkeley. Next. My name is Mary Ailings. I am the interim deputy director at the Bancroft Library, and I'm the principal investigator on the grant. I'm joined today by Marissa Friedman, who is the project manager and digital project archivist uh, at Bancroft Library on the project, and Cameron Ford, who's the co-founder of Doxy AI, which is a company formed by former UC Berkeley High School data science students. Um, and he's here to talk about the machine learning work that we're doing with them. Next. So our project was conceived in 2018 um, to be different from our previous four JAXA program grants um, in which we were basically digitizing and publishing archival records related to the internment. In this project, uh, we are going a step further in trying to extract data held in these records so it can be used for computational research. Next. We've been exploring this kind of work as part of our engagement in the collections as data work, which encourages computational use of digital and born digital collections and supports ethical access to collections and data that we steward. These concepts were codified by Thomas Padilla et al. in 2017 in the Santa Barbara Statement on Collections as Data. So our project is in alignment with these principles, and we hope we will um, also develop these as um, future models for our digital initiatives here at Bancroft. Next. So the goals of our project are fourfold. Uh, first, of course, we are creating preservation um, images of the unique resources in our collections, and we're preserving those for the long term. We are also creating a data set to build, and in this case, a more accurate data set and more complete data set to represent the Japanese American incarceration. Uh, third, to engage with community partners to guide our ethical data curation plans. Um, and this is part of a sort of a co-curation model with community members to talk about ethical access or responsible access workflows uh, to our materials. And then finally, of course, to iterate and implement tools and workflows to expand computational access to our digital special collections, again, in line with the collections as data workflows. So the value proposition of our project really is about um, finding a way to efficiently and effectively extract data held within our digital collections and to increase use of that data through computational research methods. Um, we'll be talking about the material we're working with in this specific collection, which it, uh, lends itself to the machine learning uh, process. And I, at this point, I'll turn it over to Marissa to tell us more. So I'll start with a little background on uh, the records that we're working with. Uh, the WRA, or War Relocation Authority, uh, used a census type two page form known as Form WRA 26, or uh, Individual Record to collect demographic, educational, occupational, and biographical data about every Japanese American who is incarcerated in one of 10 WRA uh, relocation camps, as they were euphemistically referred to. Um, from 1942 to April 1943, incarcerates interviewed arrivals in the camp to collect information about individuals' ages, birth dates, birthplaces, skills and hobbies, health and physical defects, weights and heights, language proficiencies, education backgrounds, occupations, and even religions. Uh, next, please. Uh, the WRA 26 forms are primarily typewritten, although several thousand forms from the Bancroft's holdings have entirely handwritten responses. Uh, many, contain, uh, many forms contain stamps, handwritten corrections, strikethroughs, notes, and other marginalia, which you can see some examples of this. Um, on the slide. Um, the existing set of Form 26 records at the Bancroft Library, numbering uh, over 110,000, are believed to be uh, the only remaining complete set of Form 26 records organized by camp in existence. Uh, next, please. 
Um, data from the forms were coded by incarcerees and other WRA office staffers to early computer punch cards during World War II. Uh, at the conclusion of the war, a copy of the punch cards and the original forms from which the punch cards were coded were deposited at the Bancroft Library. In the 1960s, the library worked with um, what was at that time the nascent UC Berkeley Computer Science Department to transfer Form 26 data on the computer punch cards um, onto magnetic tape. The Office of Redress Administration, or ORA, acquired a copy of this data in 1998 or 1988 um, to aid with identifying and dispersing reparations to former Japanese American incarcerees. Uh, when this work was finished, the file was transferred to the National Archives, and a copy of the data file was also acquired by the Japanese American National Museum in LA, um, where it be quickly became a popular information resource for those formerly incarcerated and their families. The National Archives published the data file it acquired from the ORA um, in 2003 as part of its Access to Archival Databases project. Referred to as the Japanese American Internee Data File, it currently serves as an authoritative resource for genealogical and statistical information for former inmates and their family members, as well as social science researchers. Uh, next, please. There are, however, problems with the existing data file that we are hoping to start to address with our project. Um, first, gaps, truncations, and errors were introduced over the course of the many data migrations that I uh, previously outlined. Uh, there are also a number of handwritten annotations or corrections on the original forms that may or may not have been integrated into the data file at NARA. There are also many fields that are missing or not fully represented. The NARA data set currently has 36 available fields while well, we've identified over twice that many distinct data points in the original forms. Um, information present in the original forms but missing from the NARA database include things like significant activities, skills, hobbies, educational and employment history, and more. Um, if you compare the top image on this slide, which is a snapshot of an individual's educational history from their Form 26, to the bottom, which is a screenshot of what appears in the NARA data file, you'll see that a lot of granular detail of educational institutions, dates, et cetera, are missing. And the educational history has been coded to represent only the highest grade level completed. Uh, next, please. Some information was coded to or collapsed into a predetermined set of classifications. Um, this is the case with things like occupational categories. Um, which you can compare in the bottom two images of the slide. The left is a snapshot of what appears in the NARA data file, and the right is what is represented for that individual on her original form. As is illustrated on the top image of the slide, the employment history section found in the original form contains salary information and other crucial details that are missing in their entirety from the existing data sets but we believe that they can provide valuable historical data for researchers. So what's important to note here is that there's a tremendous loss of detail and missing information in the existing data file. And we believe that the digitization of these forms provides a new opportunity to bring this data to light, particularly by leveraging the potential efficiency of machine learning. Our goal is to create a new, more granular data set that improves upon the existing data file. Uh, next, please. So to give you a sense of the scope of the project, um, I will, I'll just quickly walk you through the major stages of the project um, from my vantage point as project manager. Um, the first step is digitization, um, where you know the, the, digital, or the digital archivist prepares the original forms for a shipment to an offsite vendor for digitization. Uh, Backstage Library Works, our vendor, returns preservation copy TIFF files, access copy JPEGs, and OCR text files to the library. Um, and multiple stages of, stages of quality control are built into this process. So once we have the digitized files, we can begin to apply a trained model to read them. Um, initially in the document discovery phase, the library worked with Docs AI to establish a working data model, 
which identified and mapped regions of the documents to specific fields and types of data outputs. As the project has progressed, however, we've also made quite a few discoveries about the content and structure of the data in the original records. And so library staff collaborate with Doxy AI to integrate new observations about the records into the pipeline as we go. The next stage is testing. As Cameron will address, we've adopted an iterative approach to developing the pipeline, which handles sets of Form 26 records one camp at a time, due in large part to the variability in form, content, and other characteristics of the original documents. So with each set of forms from a particular camp, we walk through any anticipated problems, and the DOCSI team performs initial testing to make any needed adjustments. Once initial exploratory results are inspected and improved by both DOCSI and library staff, the pipeline is frozen in its current state. And all the files associated with one camp are run through a customized OCR pipeline, which includes targeted pre and post processing interventions to improve the quality of results. Then there's data storage. DOCSI uploads the extracted data to a shared private GitHub repository with some personally identifiable information, such as social, social security numbers already redacted. Library staff provide feedback on results and note areas for improvement in preparation for the next camp. Then there's data cleaning. Bancroft staff uses tools like OpenRefine to start to clean and normalize data. We also may later anonymize the sensitive fields um, based on input from our community advisory group. As Mary has mentioned, we'll be working with this advisory group to help us to think through any ethical issues pertaining to providing digital access to the data and to the digitized forms themselves. And then finally, there's data publication. The data and accompanying documentation will eventually be published on a public GitHub repository, and the access copies of the digitized forms will, if deemed appropriate, be available for public view on UC Berkeley's digital collections platform. Now I'll turn it over to Cameron to discuss the implementation of the pipeline and our results in greater detail. Thank you very much, Marissa. And um, on behalf of Doxy, you know, we feel very humbled to be part of this project with Bancroft. It's a uh, vital project for the community and we're very grateful that this has been our sort of founding project as a group of uh, data scientists recently entering the field after graduating from the iSchool at Berkeley. Um, this has been a wonderful project for us to engage on. And so part of what I want to talk about today is Marissa has walked you through kind of the, the journey of the data from incorporation together of uh, bringing the data to Doxy and then the processing, passing it back, and then what will happen afterwards. And the collaboration piece between Bancroft and Doxy is a critical part to the success of this uh, this venture. And so I want to really talk about the value of that partnership and, and why we at Doxy believe that this, uh, this model will be very useful going forward with similar projects. So one of the things that we're really talking about is automation. And it's about these, these forms contain very rich data, and it's challenging to capture all of that data through manual efforts as seen by the previous attempts where it simplified the data quite uh, drastically to be able to uh, likely move move through it in an efficient manner. Um, but in an attempt to capture as much of the data as possible, that requires a lot of um, automation because doing everything by hand is, is untenable. And so that really is where machine learning comes in. And standard machine learning is the combination of these top two circles here, where it's uh, taking into account coding as well as statistics. And that's where you'd see a lot of standard models in the marketplace. The, the challenge with these standard models is it doesn't incorporate anything about the domain that you're approaching. So much of the development in today's world is around how to automatically read forms that are present today, such as tax forms, maybe receipts, different papers that we would encounter on a day-to-day -day basis, um, not these incarcerated records from 70 years ago. And so there's what this presents is issues with the models not being prepared to handle the uniqueness of the data, which results in vast uh, amounts of inaccuracy, whether it's reading different parts of uh, dotted lines as symbols or 
uh, vertical breaks in the page as uh, letters. Um, and part that what that returns is a big blob of text and symbols, which can be searchable potentially, uh, but it will be really hard to then parse that apart. And that leads to potentially mishandling sensitive data. So if you have sensitive data, like a social security number that that's mixed in with these other um, artifacts that appear due to the inaccuracies, it can, you can potentially be leaving sensitive data present. And so that's, that's really vital for us to be able to handle appropriately due to ethical concerns. And then lastly, there's a lot of unique fields, unique ways that this was developed due to uh, being typewritten or handwritten. And so having a field by field approach allows us to handle those appropriately. Um, an example of this are the check boxes that you saw, um, for example, around languages spoken and understood. So the, the benefits with the Doxy partnership with Bancroft is that we, um, together, the two organizations are leaning in to uh, share on Doxy side machine learning knowledge and domain expertise from Bancroft side. So there's a deep understanding of this field and of these forms um, that are vital to the development of a, a pipeline that handles the data um, in a sensitive manner. What we then do is go field by field. So we develop a pipeline where each individual piece of data, we ensure that we are capturing that as, as accurately as possible. Um, then we go through the, we also have the process of handling sensitive data, scrubbing things out as, as appropriate. And then um, what's really great in the field by field approach is we can put in place specific QC processes, such as setting a dictionary of a potential terms we would expect out of a particular field. Um, or if we uh, compare age to the year of the form, uh, we can see, or sorry, the uh, date of birth, we can uh, flag something as, hey, this, if we read it incorrectly, you probably need to review this. And so we can add aspects into this data and look at it uniquely. Um, and this really then, again, at the end of the day, what it really comes down to is uh, saving time and cost, uh, because we know that funding is challenging and time is challenging in this field. And so it's, it's really vital that we partner together to find the most efficient ways to uh, make this data accessible. And the, the process, as Marissa mentioned, um, is really a collaborative one that has that uh, if we break it down into the simplest form is we start with um, bringing the data in, designing around how we want that to the outputs to look and what we uh, what we need to be doing to handle the data as accurately as possible, and then implementing a, a model there. The next step is then to measure and reflect on that. So that's where the QC process goes in. And every time that we uh, run a new model, we are looking at how are our results compared to the last time we ran and putting in place checks on a certain number of fields to ensure that we're, we're improving. Um, and then dirt, after that measurement, we can assess those. And that's when we come back together as a greater team and we start to see, okay, what is, what is happening here? What are the uh, things that are standing out to us? Uh, an example of this was that we found in one of the camps that they actually use two types of forms. And so then we were able to create a model that um, identified which form was being used. And then uh, based off of the results of that, we put in place a different pipeline. Um, so it's that sort of collaborative process that you would miss if you just use a standard model, but with a custom pipeline, you're able to iteratively develop and capture those. And so what this results in is, is a high, uh, what we feel is a very high quality of outputs. And um, so at the base, baseline is we hand back to Bancroft structured data that's ready for research. And we've set th a threshold uh, that we expect the field accuracy to be at. So each field we're measuring, how accurate are we in that? And 90% of the fields um, are above the expected results there. Um, and quite a number are actually much higher than that bar. So um, there's just a few, few of those fields that present unique challenges and um, we're constantly iterating to improve. Um, and a, a quick back of the map, napkin math as well in terms of the time savings um, with 100, over 100,000 of these forms, um, if 15 minutes per form, you start to add that up to over 13 years of people going through and of uh, manual effort to transcribe these. Um, but in six, roughly six months of work, we're able to um, extract a large amount of that data out of there. And so um, this is saving a massive amount of not just manual labor, but of time to get this to the community um, in an appropriate manner. 
Um, and then of course, through this, we're doing things like adding custom flags in there for expected errors to help with the next step of that process, which, process, which is to iterate on this data further and clean it and ensure that it's um, again, up to standards. So I think at this point, I will turn it back over to, to Marissa to talk about the, the final conclusion here. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, just to give you a sense for um, you know what the results look like coming back. Here's just a brief snapshot: um, the CSV and JSON formats. Um, you know, with the pipeline in place, it, with the pipeline in place, we get structured data back, as Cameron mentioned. Um, and prior to this, we really only had very basic and very messy OCR text files for this which as Cameron mentioned, are searchable somewhat, but don't really provide the same sort of research ready, um, high quality uh, data for, for um, users. So uh, again, just sort of reiterating the benefits of this process. Um, next. Okay. Yeah, so I think, you know, we've, we've learned a lot so far. The project is, is not over yet. Um, I think, you know, the successes really have been uh, built on leveraging our partnerships. Um, you know, all the work has been iterative. We've been working closely with Docs, AI, um, in developing, again, you know, uh, the work um, together. And, um, you know, they, they bring that technical heavy lifting and we bring that, you know, the domain expertise. And it's been a really great partnership. But we've learned a lot along the way. You know, we... We also have partnerships um, that we're looking forward to in terms of data cleanup and, and working with other data sets that are either out there or being developed, um, you know, for things like um, you know, name correction and, and other kinds of data cleanup. The other part that we're really interested um, and, and working on at this at this moment is our, our community co-curation model. So this is our community our um, advisory group meeting that we're holding next spring with members of the community who are going to come together and we're going to talk about responsible access and and you know UC Berkeley's developed some responsible access workflows as part of our digital lifecycle program and our office of scholarly communications is going to be part of that meeting to walk through walk community members through what we have come up with as responsible um, access workflows um, but we really want to look at engaging community, involving community in this work as we do it so that we can be thoughtful and responsive to um, th those whose data we steward and, and how we make it available to others. Um, in considering cost and scalability of machine learning versus um, you know, our other former ways of, of extracting data, um, you know, we need to look at what we've learned from this project. Um, you know, the size and quantity of a resource can tell you whether or not machine learning is going to make sense. Um, you know, is it a big enough um, 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 set of records for it to learn from? Um, you know, looking at things like content and structure. You know, we we thought we had forms that were all the same shape and size, and it turns out that's really not the case because they modified a form in the middle of World War II and things changed and things were placed different. They added a question. And, you know, while they look very similar um, initially, when you're doing something with a machine, it, it really does change. And I think working with Doxy closely to help, you know, us both understand that and them understand that and working with, um, you know, making their pipeline more dynamic has been a really great experience. But, you know, again, we're thinking about how much consistency matters when we're looking at using machine learning um, to extract data from an archival or historic resource. Um, and then finally thinking about the collection as data um, side of this, you know, we, we want to extract data from the resources we're digitizing or the born digital collections we're bringing in. Um, but the collections as data principles really don't tell us how far to go in cleaning up that data. How, how clean does it need to be? You know, do we do entity extraction? Do we do other sorts of correction? How far do we go and how do we document each change? So, you know, the question of what is research ready data look like has always been a big part of my, my research interest. And I think as we do this project, that's another question we hopefully will answer at some level, but I'm not sure if we will. Um, but we wanna to continue to, to look at that as we look at different sorts of collections to apply this kind of a process to. 
Um, so yeah, we have a, a ways to go yet. We hope we'll talk again um, in, in the future about our community advisor group meeting after that's um, taken place. And then, you know, some follow-up on the final project. But it's been a great learning experience so far. And, um, you know, we're, we're really happy to answer any questions if, if anyone wants to reach out to us. Next slide. You have our contact information. So uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we appreciate your time. And please do let us know if you have any questions. We'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. <laughs>